Welcome back. This is part four of the ECG Access tutorial. Uh, I'm Adam Thompson again, your host and educator for this discussion. In part three, we talked about uh, this easy five-step method of using the hexaxial diagram. Uh, remember, you'd find your lead that's most equiphasic. Uh, we said that in this one, it was AVR. You'd find AVR on the diagram, find the lead that's perpendicular to AVR. In this case, lead three would be perpendicular to AVR. You look at lead three, you say, is that positive or negative? Well, it's negative, it's down. So then you find the negative side of lead three on the diagram, you say, okay, our ECG axis is at about negative 60 degrees, and we know that's left axis deviation. Now we're gonna make it easier, because I promised you, it gets easier. Here is the quadrant method. This is a much, much easier way of doing this. Take a look at this picture here. If you notice something, uh, we have all the different possible quadrants. Uh, normal left axis deviation, extreme right axis deviation, and right axis deviation. They're separated into four nice simple quadrants to understand. Well, using intuition, we know that there's something else that separates these four quadrants, and that would be leads. Which leads separate these four quadrants? Well, looking at this, you could see that AVF, AVF, and lead one separate the four quadrants. If you can't see them, here, I'll, I'll kind of color them in for you. Here's your right axis deviation quadrant over here. Here's your normal quadrant over here. Here's your left axis deviation quadrant over here. And here is your extreme right axis deviation quadrant over here. Okay, so those two leads, lead one and AVF, separate those four quadrants. They kind of, you know, they, they'll help us out a, a little bit with this quadrant method. What does that mean? Well, if you make a circle and put the leads, positive and negative electrodes around that circle, just like so, you know that if you have a negative QRS complex in lead one, then your axis must be going in this direction. It must be going that way, okay? If it's a positive QRS complex in lead one, it must be going in this direction, this way. So what I'm saying is your QRS axis would have to be from here to here if it was a positive QRS complex in lead one. And we know that this is 90 to negative 90, okay? Well, similarly, with AVF, you have a positive electrode on the bottom here, negative electrode up top. So if you had a positive QRS complex in lead one, you'd have to be going in this direction, one of these directions, downwards. So it'd have to have an axis somewhere down here. If you had a negative QRS complex in AVF, you'd have to have an ECG axis or QRS axis somewhere up here. Well, how, what does that mean to us? How can we use that? Take a look at this 12 lead EKG. Again, we're not paying attention to the precordial leads, only our limb leads. And right now, we're only paying attention to two of them. First look at lead one. Is lead one positive or negative? Well, our isoelectric line is somewhere right about there. Oh, that was kind of bad. Somewhere right about there. So. We're above it, so it's, it's up, it's positive. So you're gonna take that diagram, you're gonna draw it on a piece of paper, separate it into four quadrants, put lead one and AVF in their respective positions, and then put the, the electrode charge. This is positive AVF, this is negative up here, this is negative one here and positive over here. And since we said that the QRS complex is positive in lead one, we could shade out that negative side. Shade out that negative side of lead one, okay? Go ahead and shade it out. All right, and then we're gonna look at the EKG again. Look at AVF. Is AVF positive or negative? AVF is right here, and certainly it's up. It's positive. So that means our QRS complex needs to be on the positive side of AVF, so we shade out the negative side. Okay, we shade out the negative side of AVF. If you combine the two, you have the quadrant that your ECG axis is in. So it doesn't give you a number, you won't know what the, the, you know, if it's 60 degrees or 70 degrees or 50 degrees, but you do know that it's normal, which is important. That's what's important to know if the, the QRS axis is deviated or not. Here's another example. Look at lead one. Is it up or down? Okay, lead one is right here. Looking at it, it's certainly up. It's positive. So we shade out the negative side on our diagram and draw these diagrams down. It takes two seconds to draw it. You just make a circle, you make a plus sign in the middle of it, you put lead one, AVF, 
and then the positive and negative symbols to kind of guide you through. All right, so lead one's up. Looking at AVF, well, it's down. So we shade out the positive side of AVF, which is on the bottom. All right, when you shade out both, you have a combination here. Look where we're at, left axis deviation. We're in the left upper quadrant, left axis deviation. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that we probably have some sort of pathology. Now, remember I told you that you have two types of left axis deviation. You have physiological and you have pathological. If you're using the quadrant method and you discover that lead one's up and AVF is down, you have left axis deviation, you want to know what type do you have, physiological or pathological. Well, the way to do that would be to look at lead two. Simply look at lead two. If lead two is mostly negative, it's pathological. If lead two is mostly positive, it's physiological. And that's the easy way to determine the two. Okay, so that's the quadrant method, and you can use that to determine if any of these exist. If any of these uh, types of axis deviation exist, for instance, we said that this one was left axis deviation, and then I told you if you look at lead two and it's mostly negative, which it is, that it's pathological left axis deviation, which means it's probably something from this li list here, uh, left anterior fascicular block being the most common thing to cause that. All right, well, that's the quadrant method, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I just really want to quick, quickly explain fascicular blocks to you. Uh, your left bundle branch has two fascicles here, and your right bundle branch only has a single fascicle, okay? So you have two over here on the left and one on the right. And you have a left anterior fascicle, left anterior fascicle, and a left posterior fascicle. It's hard to tell which is which on a two-dimensional picture, but when we say that we have a left anterior fascicular block, like we said here, that just means that one of these fascicles of the left bundle branch is blocked. It's blocked, okay? And that means that you have sort of an incomplete left bundle branch block. So imagine if you had a right bundle branch block and you had left axis deviation, which indicated a left anterior fascicular block, that would be a bifascicular block. That means you only have one lane of conduction still open, and that patient's at high risk for a complete heart block and AV disassociation. So that's another reason why this axis determination is kind of important stuff. Here's an example. If you look at lead one on this, using our quadrant method again. Okay, let's use our quadrant method. Lead one, AVF. This is positive AVF. This is positive one. This is negative one. This is negative AVF over here. Is lead one up or down? Well, it's up. So we have to shade out the negative side of lead one. Okay, and is AVF up or down? AVF is down. So we shade out the positive side of AVF. And here we are, we have left axis deviation again, okay? Left axis deviation, I told you to figure out if it's uh, pathological, you're gonna look at lead two, and if lead two is mostly down, which it is, that's pathological left axis deviation. So this here is an example of a left anterior fascicular block, most likely because you have pathological left axis deviation. And if all else fails, if the quadrant method doesn't work for you, if the, the original method I taught you doesn't work. You can always look at the EKG uh, axis itself. It gives you a printout, which these are pretty accurate. And the middle one here, it tells you, is the QRS axis. R just means uh, QRS for the uh, EKG. That's your QRS axis. You, you'll notice that you do have a P axis and a T axis, but we're not paying too much attention to these right now. In fact, your QRS axis on this tells you negative 64 which is left axis deviation, if you remember the picture again. You have 90, 0, negative 90, and 180 over here. And anything in this area is left axis deviation. So negative 60 cer certainly fits that, negative 64 rather. So that's it for part four of the ECG axis tutorial. Next, we're going to get into discussing the precordial axis. We're going to start looking at those V leads for the precordial axis, which is really quick, so I hope to see you come on back for part five.